Well, good morning again. In my younger days, I used to have the opportunity to go backpacking in Colorado. And one of the, the neat aspects was when I would get to backpack up and over the Continental Divide. And what the Continental Divide is, is it is a, a, a mountain range that splits, if you will, the, the watersheds. Yeah, the water that flows on the west side of the Continental Divide will end up in the Pacific Ocean, and the water that flows on the eastern side ends up in either the Gulf of Mexico or in the Atlantic Ocean. And so, hypothetically, if you were to pour a glass of water on the Continental Divide, it would separate and water that went west would end up in the Pacific and water that went east would end up in the Atlantic. Well, I say that to say, did you know that there is such a dividing line, spiritually speaking, for every human being? In 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 11, it says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has eternal life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. And this is the dividing line. This is the continental divide of all humanity. Young and old, rich and poor, you know, every race, every person, a person either has the Son and they have eternal life, or they don't have the Son and they do not have the eternal life. Now, this is, this is critical for us to understand. God has extended to each and every human being a, an offer of eternal life. And this eternal life is only found in Jesus Christ. In other words, the only way a person can have eternal life is through God's Son. Now, how does this happen? Well, to begin with, we have a problem. Uh, and the problem is, is that we are all separated from God. Isaiah 59.2 says, Your sinful acts have alienated you from God. Your sins have caused Him to reject you and not listen to your prayers. Whether you realize it or not, we all, we all have a broken relationship with God. Everyone does. There are no exceptions. All of us are broken because we all have sin in our lives. Now, this isn't my idea. This isn't just some religious mumbo-jumbo. This is what God Himself says in the Bible. God's Word teaches what, I, what I'm explaining here. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, God has a perfect standard. And, and because of sin, we are all separated from God. Uh, and many people will say, well, I'm fine with God. God and I, we're, we're like this. But, but that's not reality. Uh, people think, well, I'm just, I'm a good person. And so I'm, I'm okay with God and God's okay with me. But Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to us. But it only ends, it only leads to death. Uh, Habakkuk, and, and I got to thinking about this. I don't know why more parents don't name their children Habakkuk. You know, that's just, that, that's such a, a, such a unique name. Um, Habakkuk 1.13 says, You, O Lord, are too righteous to tolerate evil. You are unable to look or overlook wrongdoing. So, humanity has this terrible predicament. We are all separated from God. And under no circumstances through our own efforts can we ever get to God. 
People think God is like a cheap date, quite honestly. You know, they, all they have to do is show up and God's just like, oh, yes, please come. I, I, I want you no matter what. And, and that's just not the reality. You know, it, it is useless for us to try and get to God on our terms. There, um, you know, the, again, the Bible teaches that there is no amount of human goodness, no amount of human effort, no amount of human morality, no amount of religious activity is going to be enough to reach God. Uh, in, in chapter 11 of the book of Genesis, there's the story of the Tower of Babel. And the, 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 the point of the story of the Tower of Babel is that people got together and they said, let's build a tower that is so high that we can reach all the way to heaven and we can, we can get with God because we get all the way up to heaven. Now, we look at that and we go, that is such nonsense. How absurd for people to think that they can reach God by building a tower that, that's that tall. But we are no less absurd when we think, well, I can get to God by being a good person. I can get to God by being very moral. I can get to God by being really religious. None of those things work. That it's as silly as trying to build a tower all the way to God. Uh, again, Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. Because that's what we would do if somehow I could make it happen, I guarantee you I'd be saying, hey, look at what I did. And, and that doesn't work. The, in Titus chapter 3, beginning with verse 5, it says, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. So we need to understand that everything about salvation is a gift from God. I didn't do anything to get saved. You can't do anything to get saved. And, and we need to understand that no amount of our effort can reach that. Uh, if you have the, the sermon notes, there's a little picture in there that kind of shows here's man and here's God. And there's nothing we can do to get across the chasm to, to reach God. We, we can't do it. Now, what's the solution? Well, if we want to reach God, we have to play by God's rules. That's, that's the part we, under, we need to understand. Again, God is not a cheap date. We don't ever get to go to God on our terms, we have to go on His terms. That, you know, it's the height of, of arrogance on our part to say, well, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you the way I think I want to. That, that's absolute nonsense. God is not only perfect, and, and because God is perfect, He's perfect in every category. You pick a category, God is perfect in that category, which means that His love is also perfect. And because His love is perfect, He determined how we can reach Him. He, he looks at us and He says, I know you can't get to me based on who you are because you fall short. And so I am going to make it possible for you to come to me. But you're going to have to do it the way I tell you to. 
Romans 5.8, if you ever have, have thought, well, I don't know whether God loves me or not. I have a hard time in life, and sometimes it seems like God is kicking the crud out of me. Well, if you've ever wondered whether God loves you or not, Romans 5.8 says God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see what this is saying? God put His love into action. He didn't say, well, when you get good enough, then I'll make a way for you to, to be saved. He said, I know you're never going to be good enough, so I'm going to make the way possible. And he had Jesus die on a cross. Why is that necessary? You know, we, we talk about Jesus dying on a cross. Why does that matter? Why is that, why is that important? Because... The price of sin is death. And if you and I come before God based on our own merit, we're going to spend eternity separated from God because of our sin. The price of sin is death. And so Jesus had to die on a cross. Jesus lived a sinless life, a perfect life. He became a human sacrifice offered up on a cross. So we don't save ourselves. You know, if I, again, if I say to God, I'm going to take care of myself. I think I've been a pretty good person. And so when I come before you, I'm going to trust that I was good enough, that I was moral enough, that I was whatever enough. And if I do that, God's going to say, well, the price of sin is death. And so you are going to have to spend eternity separated from me in a place that's known as hell. Now, I, I'm not trying to sound like one of these, you know, hellfire damnation preachers. Uh, where I, I could do the old suck and blow preaching. Jesus said, you know, I, I, I could get into that. But, but that's not the point. The point is we need to understand how important this is. God has offered us salvation. But we don't get to come to God and say, this is how I want to get it. We have to come on God's terms. And this morning, what we are doing is we are celebrating what God has done for us. Jesus died on a cross, and He was buried. And three days later, He rose from the grave. Now, if Jesus had died and stayed in the grave like everybody else, we wouldn't be here right now. But because Jesus rose from the dead, we are here to celebrate that we have a risen Savior. And, and so the resurrection is proof that what God offers is legitimate. Romans 1, 4 says, And He was shown to be the Son of God when He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 4.25, He was handed over to die because of our sins, and He was raised to life to make us right with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered for our sins once and for all time. He never sinned, but He died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but He was raised to life in the Spirit. See, all of those verses, and there are many, many more, all of them are pointing to the same thing. We're separated from God. We needed salvation. Jesus is the salvation. We believe in Him. And through that faith, through that believing in Him, we can now have a relationship with God. The only way to know God and be accepted by God is through Jesus Christ. And because of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross, the Bible says that he that has the Son has life. And that's what that picture is, is demonstrating, is the only way to God 
is through Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, But to all who have received Him, those who believe in His name, He has given the right to become God's children. And then John 3.16-18 through 18 says, For this is the way God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world should have, be saved through Him. The one who believes in Him is not condemned, but the one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Please hear what this is saying. And again, um, when you leave, if you don't have the sermon notes and you're thinking, oh, I need to remember these verses, they're on the sermon notes. And the whole point of, of what this is, is communicating is, if you don't have Jesus, you do not have eternal life, period. The only way to have eternal life is through Jesus. So how, do you, how does a person get saved? There's only one way. Jesus said that the gate is narrow and the path is narrow that leads to eternal life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. So there's only one way. One way only. Period. There, there are not many ways to God. You will hear people say, oh, there are many paths that lead to God. No, that is a lie. There is one path. The, first, the thing you have to do is you have to say, I understand I am a sinner. I cannot make it to God on my own. I cannot do it, period. I am trusting Jesus, period. There is no other way. I realize that I fall short, and so when Jesus died on the cross, I recognize He was dying for my sins and I am placing my faith, my hope, my trust in Him. That's it. There isn't some other way. And the way you receive Christ is by expressing that to Him and saying, I want you, Jesus. I don't have any other plan. You are my plan. Now, for those who have been Christians, who have been following Jesus for any length of time, what you have quickly discovered is that even though you have committed your life to Christ, you didn't all of a sudden find out that, man, life, life is now easy. Boy, everything just goes like it, 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 it's, it's just a, it's a cakewalk. Um, it, if you have found that, please, I'd love to talk to you and find out what you're doing because I, um, I, I haven't found that. Um, you know, the, the truth is, is, even though we are new creations in Christ, we still sin, we still struggle, we still mess up. And, and that can be really frustrating. You know, sometimes we can feel like something must be wrong. Did, did I not really get saved? You know, the, the, the fact is, a lot of times, and I'm being real honest with you, a lot of times I feel disgusted with myself. I, I feel gross about who I am, that I'm, I'm not the person that, that I feel like I'm supposed to be. In good grief, I'm a preacher, you know? And, and so, what's wrong? Did, did I not really get saved? Well, when Jesus comes into our lives, we are new creations. We, we are born again. We are spiritually born. Salvation comes to us. And, and we are given a new life in Christ. But the reality is, we're still in our old frame. We're still in our, our old person. The Holy Spirit enters our life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. So I now have Christ living in me, but I am still in my old person, and I still have my old mind. 
And my old mind is capable of thinking up some pretty nasty stuff, some pretty raunchy stuff, some pretty ungodly stuff. And so I have to come to understand that just as I am 100% relying on Jesus to save me, I also have to be completely 100% relying on Jesus to live each and every day in the Holy Spirit. Every time I step out, every time you step out and do anything in our own strength, in our own ability, even if on the surface it seems successful, if it isn't God-driven, if it isn't Holy Spirit-authored, then it is failure. Because my righteousness is filthy rags. That means that the very best I can do falls short of God. So when you and I function outside of God, we are still essentially trying to build a tower to God. You know, we're still saying, God, I'm coming to you, but I'm coming to you on my terms. And, and we can't do that. To live the Christian life correctly, we must have total dependence on the Holy Spirit. When it comes to living the Christian life, what we have to understand is that we become like children. We are adopted into God's family. John 1.12 says, But to all who believed in Him and accepted Him, He gave the right to become the children of God. Well, let's think about a child. Is a child self-reliant? No. Can a child take care of themselves in any way? No. Can a child do anything really by themselves? No, not really. Well, if we are a child of God, we need to understand that's the way we are to function. Totally, 100% dependent on God. See, too often what we think is, okay, I'm saved now. Now it's up to me to go out and, and live this life um, to the best of my ability. And that is an absolutely wrong mindset. Jesus said we are to die to ourselves daily and take up our cross and follow Him. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So based on that verse alone, and, and again, there are many other teachings by Jesus where we need to get the idea that we cannot function apart from Jesus. We cannot do anything apart from Jesus. You know, since Jesus saved me, and I did absolutely nothing to save myself, I need to understand that now that I am saved, I can do nothing myself apart from Jesus. So the whole Christian life is learning to be completely submitted and obedient to Jesus, to die to self daily. Jesus is, in, in Hebrews, He's referred to as our high priest. So what we understand is, every day we live submitted to Jesus. And when we go out and we mess up as we will, we go to Jesus as our high priest and say, forgive me. I messed up. I, I just blew it. I lost my temper. You know, I, I cussed out the dog. I, you know, I did whatever. I bit the cat's tail. You know, I, 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 I lost my, my mind. I, I lusted. I did whatever I did. God, I'm sorry. That's not who I'm trying to be. I want to be like you. And so I am submitting myself to you. And understand that the Bible says that when we confess our sins, we are forgiven of our sins. And so every day, we die to ourselves. Every day, we fail completely. And that's what we're supposed to do. I can't be me anymore. I must be Christ in me. And so... We, we recognize 
our emptiness. We recognize our, our incompletion and we trust Jesus. We come to God on His terms, never on our own. And we do that for our salvation, and then we do that every day for the rest of our lives. And what you will discover is a God who loves you, a God who forgives you, a God who embraces you as His child. He wraps His arms around you, and He holds you close, and He says, I love you. I forgive you. Now let's just keep on going. You know, think about a child who's learning to walk. You don't punish the child when they fall down. You pick them up and you dust them off and you help them stabilize and then they begin again. And that's the, understand that's you in Christ every day for the rest of your life. Let's pray. Jesus, I begin by just thanking you and giving you all of the glory because we have nothing, nothing outside of you and apart from you. And had you not gone to the cross, we would have no hope. And had you not risen from the dead, we would have nothing, absolutely. And so thank you that you saved me. I am a wretched sinner. I, there is nothing good in me, and I, I, I know that. I recognize that. And I just pray, Father, that you will help each person here who has never come to that understanding to understand that. That they won't lie to themselves and think, I'm good enough. And then, Father, for those who have never committed their lives to you, I pray for them especially right now. I pray that you would give them the the wisdom, the faith that they need to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I, I realize that I cannot, I can't do it on my own. Please forgive me of my sin. Take it from me. And please fill my life with your presence. And Father, I know that even as, as Christians, we struggle we get frustrated. We feel a sense of discouragement. I know I do. And so I just, I pray that you will help each of us to, to understand we are still helpless. Even though we now have you in our life, we are helpless to live the Christian life apart from you. Jesus, we need you. We might be at different stages but we all need you just the same. And I just pray that you'll help each of us to understand that completely today. And it is in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.